Hello, you're back again for more adventures in Australian literature. And um, before we start, remember we have templates. I'm sure you can see that with the lights and book. And also we have a newsletter uh, that the link for that is down below. It's it's on the Black Cocky Press website. You can put your email address in and get uh, signed up for the newsletter, which comes out twice a month, gives you an idea of what's new, what's happening, really good value to, you know, keep, you, keep up to date with what is going on in Black Cocky Press world. So, what are we doing today? Today, I've uh, got a pile of books here. Today we are having a look at For Love Alone by Christina Steed. Christina Steed is an Australian writer. Um, she was writing most of her books. This one was written in the 1940s, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s is I think when she's most active as a writer. She's actually quite, she's got quite a few books that she has written um, but she's also very 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 little known and read in Australia um, that's 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 got several there are several reasons for that um, as you can see very chunky book very very chunky book um, which I will come to she does write very big books that I think has led to her being um, somewhat neglected uh, in Australian literature though at the same time chunky books doesn't mean anything you know people read plenty big books but it's partly some other things about Christina Steed that do have an impact on um, her continuing to be read um, she is also a writer who left Australia very early. She left Australia and she didn't come back for a long time. And for a lot of Australians, they held that against her. There was a real tall poppy quality to the, the treatment of Christina Steed of, oh, what do you, you know, you think you're the smart girl who wrote, read some books, oh, what do you come back here? You know, a lot of that. Um, especially considering when she came back, the 60s, 70s, deep, deep cringe. I will do a video on the cringe. Um, deep, deep cultural cringe period. And so she did suffer from that. The other thing that makes her book suffer is because she was writing outside of the country and because she had various pressures from foreign publishers, either English or American publishers. This had an impact on the stories that she wrote. Um, so for instance, her most famous book, uh, The Man Who Loved Children, which is somewhat autobiographical, is flawed because she has set it in America. And so she has effaced the Australianness out of her out of her story, but then and replaced it with an American, a well-researched, but still somehow ringing hollow Americanness, which has pick, been picked up by both critics, both American and Australian. Is it's not Australian enough, and then there it's not American enough because you have an American setting but you also have an Australian understanding of the world and those two things do not they just they're completely different to each other she's writing with an Australian sensibility but setting things in countries that are not Australia and as a result they end up sounding like a, a weird hybrid you know when somebody spends a long time in another country and they pick up a sort of a, a, a an Americanized version of their accent or a Englishized version of their accent and then they just sound like weird hybrids that don't belong anywhere 
little bit like that. That's sort of what has happened to Christina Steed as a writer. Um, so this one is set in Australia. So it doesn't have that deeply flawed problem. In fact, this one came just after The Man Who Loved Children and she was so dissatisfied with the transposing of her story to an American setting and the fact that it did not do what she wanted it to do because of that transposition she insisted this one no it's going to be set in Sydney and this works so much better for being in Sydney now this is the story of Teresa Hawkins Teresa Hawkins is 19 years old Teresa Hawkins wants desperately to fall in love but this is not a romance as you may assume by that. Tessa Hawkins doesn't want to fall in love in a, you know, um, the way all her, co her cousins and her friends and her sister and whatever else, she, you know, marry a boy from school, the school, marry a boy that they've grown up with and go out to the suburbs and raise a family. She wants, she wants something big, she wants something passionate, she wants something more than. And she thinks she has found this in Jonathan Crow, who is a young man that I believe she meets at a, like a, a public lecture. And Jonathan Crow has all these ideas and, and we've all been 19. Well, maybe, but you know when you're 19, ladies, and somebody who's a little bit older and seems to be paying you attention, and, and you're so like, ooh, because frankly, you haven't had a lot of attention, and so you just sort of think that they're, they're everything, and you know, then you look back on it, you look back on it when you're 25, 30, and you just go, oh, the hell did I see in him? He was an ass. He was a complete dickhead. That's what Jonathan Crow is. <laughs> you read it and you are just like, he's a dickhead. Hey, what a wanker. This guy, he thinks in, he mansplains. Oh my God, the mansplaining. Oh, like <laughs> the mansplaining this guy goes through and, and, and the, 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 the way he talks to her and he, he's not interested in her. He's not, but she's 19. She doesn't know squat. She doesn't know anything because she has no life experience so she is absolutely prime pickings for a predatory male like Jonathan Crow. he tells her you know telling her what to think telling her what to do and she is going she decides she's going to go to London she's he's going to London he's he's got this very high opinion of himself he's he's today I think he would be an incel he, he just just totally would be an incel and she is too naive to really work out that he's one of these weirdo mouth breathy men um, I, 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 I'm, I'm mean but you know he's awful he's absolutely awful you read it and it's like I'm, I'm, I'm like is this gonna do some sort of Mr. Darcy turn around no oh okay no, he's, he's, he's never gets better. So she meets him. She is, at 19, she's decided, she's, she's started um, being a trainee teacher, um, but she leaves that job with the education department because, like, the assumption is, oh, you're, you, you don't have anyone in your life, you need to get a career, and so, you know, um, you're going to get a job with the department, which, of course, is assuming you are never going to get married because 
a job with the Department of Education in these days ends when you get married. You could not be a married woman and work for the government, for the New South Wales government. So she starts out with going and doing teaching but ends up quitting because she's fallen in love with this, this man. Uh, I'm not uh, and she also doesn't really like it. She gets a job in a factory, and when it says in a factory, she's a secretary in a factory. She's not on the factory floor. But she, her family live in Watson's Bay, and the factory is in, I don't know, Camperdown, Redfern, that sort of, somewhere near the University of Sydney, that sort of area. Anyway, she is determined to get to London to see, to, to be with Jonathan Crow. And so she starts saving. Her way of saving, now she lives at home with her father and her two brothers and her widowed father has more or less just given up on work and is living off his children. So he, he, has, he has trapped his children into basically supporting him. He could go out and get a job, but it means that neither Tessa nor her brothers can go on and move on with their lives as adults. So her, he has his adult children. Their father is controlling his adult children through his dependency. And um, so Tessa is having to keep him, so put her money towards the household kitty. And everything else she is saving. And she is saving on things like she's not buying her lunch. She is walking from Watson's Bay, or at least the ferry terminal, to save the, the penny bus fare. She basically walks her way to London by putting herself through this unbelievable physical endurance test which she is doing through love she wants to go to london she wants to study she wants to do this um fiona wright who i spoke of in my video on the writer you hate to love talked about um the fact that tessa hawkins her behavior is somewhat borderline eating disorder it is disordered it is um, dangerous. She does. She loses massive amounts of weight with all of this walking and not eating. Um, one of her bosses actually does fall in love with her, but she's so fixated on Crow. She does get to London, only to discover that Jonathan Crow. She worked, finally, finally works out what everyone else who'd read the book at the beginning worked out. He's not worth it, babe. Just, just cut your losses. He's a loser. Um, but it's not... You don't read Christina Steed for necessarily the story. She does find that love. She does find that love. But it's not with Jonathan Crowe. It's not with Jonathan Crow. He's not Mr. Darcy. He's not got a heart of gold. He's Mr. Collins, if he were anything. He's he's got that sort of uh, vibe. She does find that she does find someone. Um, but this also represents another trope that is quite strong in Australian literature, which is the clever clever, industrious, determined, brave, fierce girls. Now, uh, before I started reading Australian literature, um, I'd, I'd read very little and all that I'd read were men. Men and they were stories of blokes in the bush and as a girl, I was like, where do I feel? fit I have no idea where I fit and as it, it is very very important if you can't see it you can't be it that is true of representation across the board this is why representation is so important if you can't see 
black people on television if you can't or in books if you can't see Asian people on television in books if you can't see queer people on television in books in literature how do you know how to be it well as a as a woman as a young woman growing up in Australia I felt the same way with the books that were offered me I didn't see me Christina Steed's Tessa Hawkins taps into what actually is a very strong trope in Australian literature and that is the girls who go and get themselves an education the girls who want more than they currently have who will sacrifice who will work hard and who will do it the clever fierce girls so that's who ultimately with this that's where the love comes in Jonathan Crow is really a straw man but she is one of those clever fierce girls who will sacrifice everything to get what she do, what she needs what she really needs and this is a is a trope that is actually it's, it's really old. It goes all the way back to uh, Miles Franklin and My Brilliant Career. So it's a very old trope in this country. Remember, Australia was one of the first countries, if not the first country, that opened university degrees to women. University degrees were liberalised and opened to women. You could get a doctorate you could get a law degree, you could actually get a degree, a proper degree, not a, not a, um, like in England, sort of a honorary, not real degree, but a proper degree from Australian universities. It was really, really early for that. It was, um, it was, it was late 19th century, but it was compared to other places in the world. This was, this was radical. Australian women are these fierce, clever girls, or at least some of us are. And this book, that is why I would say read Christina Steed. She is really chunky, she writes really chunky books. She could so do with an editor. She does have the problem of some of her books are a little bit not sure if they're one thing or another but for love alone has an Australian voice could do with an editor honestly I did find it somewhat repetitious I'm not sure I needed quite so much walking across Sydney to get the 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 um, the, the message across but it's worth reading because it is one of the books with the bright clever fierce girls because that is something that Christina Steed was it is something that Australia has and it's something if you want to see yourself as an Australian woman and wonder where do I fit in with the blokes in the bush and the beer and the utes this is where you fit in this is where you fit in so for Love Alone by Christina Steed have a look at it and I will see you again with another another adventure in Australian literature sometime later so until then bye bye have fun if you would like to support this channel come across to the Black Cocky Press website www.blackcockypress.com.au where you will find books and other writing services to help with your writing